bless the Lord, everyone, and uh, welcome to the final session in our Missions Convention 2020. And um, in today's session, we are going to be looking at our theme, which is, as you know, more than conquerors through Christ. And so let us go to the scripture, Romans chapter 8, verse 37, and it reads thus, Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Amen. Um, so let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your goodness and your mercies. Dear God, we thank you for being here with us today. Dear God, we thank you for the blessings that you have bestowed upon us in Missions Convention 2020. Dear God, today as we look in your scriptures, we pray, O oh God, that your spirit will be with us. We pray that you will lead and that you will guide us into your truth. Have your own way, O oh God, as we give you all the glory, all the honor and the praise belong it unto you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, um, so the theme is found in Romans chapter 8 and verse 37. And as we go to the slide, we will see that it is said that Romans chapter 8 is one of the most wonderful chapter in the entire Bible. It starts with an emphatic declaration that there is no condemnation and with an with an emphatic declaration uh, that there is no condemnation to them that are in Christ. And the book, Romans chapter 8, also ends with an equal emphatic statement that there is no separation from the love of Christ Jesus. However, the thing that I found most astonishing is the contrast between the Paul of Romans chapter 7 and the Paul of Romans chapter 8. In Romans chapter 7, we see Paul and Paul is struggling, as it were. In chapter 7, he says that in verse 8, rather, of chapter 7, he explained that they, they, that they were all manner of concupiscences in him. He went on further to state that the commandments that were ordained to be life, he found to be death. Paul said he didn't do the good he planned to do, but in, instead he found himself doing the evil that he hates. He tops it off by calling himself a wretch and cried, which I believe was a cry of anguish, a cry of anguish, who shall deliver me from this body of death? So real was the, the, the struggle that Paul describes in Romans chapter 7 that some scholars wonder if Paul, if this was the safe Paul, or was he speaking 
of his time before his transformation. And I remember as a, as a youngster, I, 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 I spoke to one of our leaders about this. And he said to me, it doesn't matter. He said to me that it didn't matter. It didn't matter whether Paul was saved or not. It did not add to the exegesis of the scripture, or it shouldn't. And I, and, and, and I didn't really understood, understand what he, he, he said, why he said that, you know, it, it wasn't, it didn't matter whether Paul, as he write here of his experience and of his struggle, whether he was writing of his struggle as a saved individual, or he was writing of his struggle as an unsaved. Because at the end of the day, whether you are, you can be saved, you can have the Holy Spirit, but you can behave in a way just as if you are not saved. I know the scripture says, I know the, the saying says that, you know, any man that come in contact with Jesus, they would never be the same. And, and, and this is a very powerful statement. And as it seeks to bring glory to God, or to Christ, you know, I, I want to agree with it. However, when you look back at the scriptures, I, you know, I wonder if this is true, if this is a true statement to make. Because we find there were several persons, even when Christ was upon the earth, there were several persons that came to him and left the way they came. My mind go back to the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler came to Jesus. He the Bible said he worshipped him. He called him good master. And he proceeded to have a discussion with Jesus. But as, you know, but as he left, or when he left there, the Bible said that he left there and he was sad. Because he was unable to do what God requested of him to do. And so it is not so much, you know, to come into the presence of God. But what is also important is the attitude we have as we are in the presence of God. What is important is the is the um our our, 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 our mindset as we are in the presence of God. Now the woman with the issue of blood, and this story is well known, she came and she, the Bible says she pressed her way to touch Jesus. And as she touched him, the scripture says that virtue flow from Jesus and minister to her needs. However, before she actually touched him, the scripture said she had said in her heart, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, then I know that I will be made whole. The, 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 the Bible records that there was a multitude that was there. The Bible records that the multitude was pressing up against him. The multitude was was touching him, but the virtue of God did not flow to any of those other individuals that was there thronging him, touching him, bumping up in him because of their, their attitude. There was nothing in their heart to say, you know, they want to, to be ministered to by God. There was no, there was no expectation. There was no faith, you know. There was just... 
There was, you know, nothing like that. On the other hand, this woman touched God out of a need, out of a, the right attitude. And we see that even without Christ's permission, as it were, the virtue flow and ministered to her need. What am I saying here? That it is not just to have the Holy Spirit. You can have the Holy Spirit and still struggle as Paul struggled, or as Paul record the struggle here in Romans chapter 7. The, 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 the secret to success, as one person put it, is not so much only to have the Spirit, but is to allow the Spirit to have you. Amen. And so we end Romans chapter 7 with Paul um, crying with a cry of anguish, as it were, that he, you know, who shall deliver him from the body of this death? And then we jump over to Romans chapter 8. And now Romans chapter 8 as I said before, start with an emphatic declaration that there is no, therefore no, no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. You see, what Romans chapter 7, Romans chapter 7, what it was saying to us, or what it was showing us, is that we, is the struggle that we will have if we go in our own power, if we go in our own strength, if we go according you know, to our own way, it, it doesn't matter how talented you are, it doesn't matter how disciplined you are, there is none of us that is, was probably as disciplined as the Apostle Paul were. However, we find him read saying these words that, you know, the things that he would do, the things, the good things that he wanted to do. When he said that, you know, he was going to pray such and such a time, or when he says that he was going to, he was not going to get upset, no matter what the boss said to him. You know, he find that he was not able to do those good things that he, he contemplated and make up it in his mind that he was going to do. He found that he, he fell short of doing them because of the, the, the limitation that is in his flesh. And he found also that the good things that he wanted to do, he wanted to rejoice when a brother got promoted. He wanted to feel happy for them. He found that he was not able to do some of these good things um, that he wanted to do. But the evil that he hates, the Bible says, that he found himself doing. And this is what happened if we should rely upon our own flesh. This is what happened to the unsaved because the unsaved doesn't have an option. And this will also happen to the saved individual, to the person that received the Holy Ghost and is filled with the presence of God. If he does not rely on that spirit, he will still find himself falling short of what, you know, he, he ought to be in God. And so Romans chapter 7, it sums up our effort under the magnifying glass, which is called the law. Romans chapter 8, on the other hand, it shows us that, God, that the Spirit of God can deliver us from the body of death that he described in chapter 7. Amen. Bless the Lord. And so that deliverance from the body of death is provided through the quickening spirit of God. And so even before Paul deals with more than conqueror, being more than conqueror to these things. And you'll find that these are some specific things that he 
um, outlined in chapter 35, he is dealing first with the struggle that is within us. The struggle that is within our own nature, the sinful nature. And he's showing that there is deliverance from the sinful nature, or rather that Christ has provided deliverance from the sinful nature that dwells in us. And in a nutshell, that is covered in Romans chapter 8 from verse 1 to 11. Amen. And so, in summary, it is saying that, that the law of the Spirit has freed us from the law of sin and death. And, you know, just to el elaborate on this a little more, you know, because Paul said that he found that a, there is a law within him, a principle at work, that when he would do good, evil is present with him. And um, it is like, so one person explained it like this. He said it's like gravity. Gravity will always pull us down, you know. Gravity will always pull us down. Um, however, when we look at Newton's, I think it's his second law of motions, we find that um, aircraft and jet engines have, were able to overcome this, this gravitational pull to the earth by another law, which is the law of aerodynamics, which send an airplane, you know, soaring in the sky, um, as it were, not um, being hampered by the law of gravity. And so it is with Christ. There is a, a, another law, the law of the spirit. And if we, if we, as the scripture said in chapter 8 and verse 1, or verse 2 rather, if we should live according, if we should, you know, desire the, the, the things of the flesh, and if we should walk after the things of the flesh, um, then we should not prosper. But if we should walk after the, the things of the Spirit, and if we should follow this law of the Spirit, and if we should abide by it, then this law of the Spirit will overcome the law of sin and cause us to have a victorious life. Amen. And so in Hebrews chapter 10, Again, Paul, he speaks about this in the form of the new covenant. He said, this is the covenant I will make with them. After these days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their hearts. And in their mind, I will write them. And so, for the child of God, when we receive the Holy Spirit, what we receive among other things, is the law of God written upon the fleshly table of our heart. Um, unlike the law of Moses that was written upon tables of stone, which the table of stone there is saying that, you know, there is no great emotion, there is no great desire for, for us to do it, you know. The, the law of, the, the, in the new covenant, writing of the laws upon our heart is also speaking about God giving us an emotion, a desire, um, not just do it. You know, he's not just saying follow it and we have to follow it, follow it um, monotonously. No, when he writes the law upon our heart, he gives us a desire to do the thing. So we want to love our brother. We want to do the right thing. We want to pray. We want to fast. The Bible says, with joy shall he draw water from the wells of salvation. So that we get a desire, a, you know, a, an emotional response to doing the things of God. Amen. Bless God. And so then, if we obey the law of the Spirit, and if we walk according to the law of of the spirit then we will overcome the laws of the flesh and so in the first part of Romans chapter 8 Paul is showing us 
that there is deliverance from the, 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 the nature of sin that is within us. Amen. Bless the Lord. He went on further to, 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 to speak about um, the things that happens to us. Amen. And he's saying that in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, it says that, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Now, I want you to notice this, this that it's not, it's not, it didn't say that all things work together for good for everyone. No, but he is specific. He's saying all things work together for good. For them, you know, that are called according to his purpose. Um, it is for them, note that the provision is not for all. It is only for those who love God. And if we look at if you look at it, you know, what we're saying here is that when we are called according to his purpose, then advancing the kingdom of God is important to us. You know, it is important to us. And this reminds me of an experience that Paul has in Romans, in, in, sorry, in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 12. The Bible record Paul saying, the scripture said, but I would... I would ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happen unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. And so what is the things that has happened to him? Well, Paul was placed in prison. He was placed in prison. And Paul is saying that God has, God, because he loved God and because he is called according to the purpose of God, God was able to work this situation so that it benefited the kingdom of God. So Paul said that he rejoiced and he sees it as, a go as good that his imprisonment caused the brethren to preach Christ. So whatever it is happening to you, rest assured that God is using it towards the advancement of his kingdom. And, and as I said before, this is what happened to us when we are called according to his purpose. And sometimes it, the thing that happened to us, the working for the good, for our good, is not just for our benefit, but it's also for the benefit of the kingdom of God. The, 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 the things that happened to Paul caused more people to preach Christ. And when more people preach Christ, more people got saved, more people got the Holy Ghost, more people receive salvation. So, you know, these things, nobody didn't prophesy about them. They just happen. Things happen. But if we love God, you know, um, Paul is saying that God will work these things out to our good. Bless God. Amen. And so now we're going to look at in um, verse 29 of Romans. So it reads us, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the first born among many brethren. Amen. So when we look at the predestination of God, the, the, the scripture said in Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 5 that God, God knew Jeremiah 
before he formed him in his, in, his, in his mother's womb. So before Jeremiah was formed in the womb, God knew Jeremiah. God said that. God said that to Jeremiah. And he said that he had ordained him a prophet before, before he was even born. God had ordained him a prophet. Now look at this. If God does that to Jeremiah, Jeremiah was a prophet. How much more will God do to us who is a child of the kingdom of God? When Jesus was, was upon the earth, one of the points that he made was that of all the prophets, John the Baptist was the greatest. John the Baptist was the greatest among all the prophets. He went further to say that the least in the kingdom of God was greater than John. So it, 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 it simply goes to show that there is an inherent greatness that is in the child of God. And so if God should call the prophet and predestine him, how much more has he called us even before our mothers, before we were formed in our mother's womb and has ordained us to be a saint. And being a saint is a big thing. Being a saint in the, child, in the house of God is a huge thing. It's not a, 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 a simple thing. It's a huge thing in the eyes of God. Okay. And so then, um, so, so God knew us, our God called us before we were born. He, uh, he handpicked us. He chose us. Many of us as relatives that were smarter, that was more intelligent, that, you know, probably was better looking than us. But God chose us. He chose you. He handpicked you. Amen. That's the Lord. But he went further to say, that not only did God predestine us, right? Or let us look at rather what I believe God means when he speaks about him predestinating us. You see, um, the predestination of God, or God predestinating, God predestinating us, how I view that is a sculpture. It's like a sculpture. Now, most sculptures, when they have a, when they're gonna create a work, they have in their mind. They have in their mind an image of the of what they are doing. So they have an image of the work. That is in their mind. Amen. And they are guided by that image. As they sculpt. If we look at a potter. The potter has in his mind. A image. Of the work that he is creating. And as he, as he molds that, that clay, there is an image that he has. And he is he's looking at the image in his mind and he is forming the clay. And so it is with God. As he molds us, as he sculpts us, there is an image that he has in his mind. And that image that he has is the image of Christ. So as he chipped away at us, he is looking and ensuring that we are looking more and more as Christ, of Christ. And so God has predestined us. He has, he has the image of Christ 
in his head, you know, as he is molding and um, creating us. Amen. Bless God. And so John picks it up and he says that we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And so that it, it, it goes to show that he is, a, he is successful, he will be successful in creating Christ in us. He will be successful in forging the character of Christ in us. And I just want to add that even though he is creating the image of Christ in all of us, in me, in you, in all of us, he does not do it by taking away our personality. You know, he doesn't do it by taking away our personality. But what he does is that he creates a Christ version, or what I call a Christ version of my personality. All right? So I am, I am probably quiet. Some people say I'm quiet. I'm not sure how quiet I am, but some people say I'm quiet. So I'm probably quiet by nature. Right? So there are other folks that are not of that disposition. Now, what Christ is doing is not necessarily going to take that loud person and make them as quiet as me, or take me and make me as, you know, that loud person. No. What, what, what Christ is doing is that he is creating Christ, uh, a, a, a version of Christ in us that fits my personality. Amen. He wants us to keep our individuality. So I don't, I don't, have, to, I don't have to act like Pastor Daly. Right? Because that is how Pastor Daly is. But Christ is forging, you know, um, God in me or Christ in me or a Christ version of me that is, that is you know, that doesn't change who I am but, but just allow me to act as Christ would. Amen. Bless the Lord. And so that... And, 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 and so that I'm saying this to say that we all worship, we, you know, we all worship differently. You know, we all praise God differently. And that is what makes us unique. Don't allow persons to take away that uniqueness about you because God loves that. Don't allow, you know, that person to change you and to say, no, look here, this is how you have to act is if you have to be holy. No, you can be holy and retaining your, the core of your personality. Amen. Bless the Lord. So the Bible says that God, whom he called, them he also justified. And notice that it is Christ that justify us. It's not we that justify us ourself, right? It is Christ that justifies us. Um, in, in, in Psalms chapter 32, I believe, and verse 1, the Bible says, Blessed is the man whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute iniquity. And so our sins are covered by the atonement work of Jesus Christ. Right? So when God calls us, he predestinates us to be conformed unto the image of his son, and he justifies us in his sight. Bless the Lord. So Paul went on to say in Romans chapter 31, and as I said, I'm working my way up unto the theme, what shall we then say to these things? So he's summing it up, and he's saying, you know, what can I say for all this that I speak about? The predestination of God, the justification that God gives us, the glorification, 
What shall I say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? If the omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent God, is, if he is for you, if he is vested and actively working on your behalf, then all those that are against you are really irrelevant. Because, as I said before, the omnipotent God, the, the, the all-powerful God, he can do all things that he wants to do. The omniscient God, he knows everything. He knows exactly what you need and when you need it. The omnipresent God, he is there with you all the time. You know, if this God is for you, if he is on your side, if he is working on your behalf, then it doesn't matter, you know, who is against you. It doesn't matter who is trying to bring you down. It doesn't matter who is fighting you on the job. It doesn't matter who is fighting you at church. It doesn't matter who is fighting you, period. You will have the victory if God is on your side. The Bible says that he, he's, he, he didn't spear his son. Didn't, didn't, didn't spear his son. The, his son probably, you know, for most people, the son is the most choice or prized possession. And so God giving his only begotten son, as the scripture says, is a, a guarantee to us. That this man is willing to, to do anything for us. He, will, he, he is willing to go all the way. He is willing to do whatever it requires. Whatever, whatever it is that is required. To be saved. For him to save you. He is willing to do it. For your salvation. And so God is fully vested in us. And he's actively um, working on our side. And so that he asks the question, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? And when I look at this scripture, I ask myself, was Paul, really, was Paul addressing the, the Christians? Was he, was he speaking to the, the church? Because you will know that in the story of the prodigal son, who it is that gave the prodigal son a hard time when he wanted to come back to his father? It was the prodigal son's own brother that got upset, that didn't want to join in the party, that was displeased and voiced it to the father. And so, so it is sometimes that it is, the, it is our own brother sometimes that makes it so difficult, hallelujah, to pick ourselves up when we fall, when we falter, sometimes it is the, the, the thing that is foremost on our mind is what the brethren is going to be saying. Is what the, 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 the sister that we sit beside, what that sister will be saying. You know, the looks that we will get. And some folks, and some folks, regrettably, can't manage this. And it becomes an obstacle. And they refuse to come back to God. Remember, it's not you they're coming back to. You weren't the one that died for their sin. It was God that died for them. But we give them such a hard time because of our own self-righteousness that we make it, as it were, difficult to come back to God. 
But Paul asks the question, who shall lay anything at the charge of God's elect? Because it is Christ that died. Um, I'm sorry, pardon me. But, you know, I, I don't care much about what you are saying if it is trying to stop me from progressing in God. Uh, because you weren't the one that died for my sin. You weren't the one that filled me with the Holy Ghost. And so if I fall and I have to come back, I'm not going to be allow you to stand in my way. And so what am I saying, brethren? Let us not stand in our brother's way. You know, let us encourage them when they fall. Let us encourage one another to continue in the faith. Let us, let us, let, let us help them. Let us pick them up as it were. Amen. Let us not lay things to the charge. Let us not hold it over them. Let us not remember it one year after. Two years after, let us not be speaking of it. Five years after it happened, we are still saying, oh, I remember he did this. And I remember, let us not do that. Let us not lay anything to the charge of God's elect. So here Paul is showing us how to overcome, you know, the criticism, as it were, of maybe even our own brethren. Maybe even our own you know, family members. Amen. Um, bless God. And then he went on to verse 37. And he said, Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that love us. And that is Romans chapter 8 and verse 37. Now, I want you to understand that when he said nay, or as the Bible said, no, he is referring back to the scripture in Romans chapter 35. When he asks the question, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. And so, these, and so Paul has put, not an exhaustive list, list, but I believe a list of likely things that have separated or could separate us from God. And he's answering his question and he said, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. And the word that he used there is hyper noco men. I think that's how it's pronounced. Hyper noco men. That is the Greek word that is translated more than conquerors. Or actually it is translated we are more than conquerors. Apparently, the translators struggled to find an equal word, a word of equal weight, to substitute for the, for the Greek word, hyper no common. You know, they struggled to find the, 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 an, an equivalent word. Um, and so the word conqueror, is chosen, and he, the, the, the translators are saying that conqueror bears the essence in terms of the meaning of this word. Because hyper um, no command really means to conquer or to have the victory over your enemy. But, but, while conqueror does bear the core of its meaning, it didn't give you the full impact of the, the Greek word. And so what the translators did was to add more than conqueror to it. So that what the translators are saying, 
You didn't just conquer. Because conquer means to win. But you could win and the fight was close. Right? You could win you know. It could be a close fight. And you were able to conquer the enemy. But it was close. Or you could win by, in basketball terms, a blowout. Both of those, you could say that you conquered. Because conquer does not tell you the magnitude of the victory. So the writer, in trying to, to, to find an equal phrase to the word, he add more than conqueror to it. So he, 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 it is an attempt by the translators to actually give you the full impact of the word hypernocomen, which means a decisive victory. It means a blowout. He's saying that, look here, this thing is not even close. It's not even close. Tribulation doesn't come close. Distress, what God has invested in us, doesn't come close. Persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, it's not a close fight. It is a bloat, as it were. In cricket, we'd say it's a whitewash. Right? So that is what the term means. And now Paul used the word, um, he used the first person plural. Um, I'm sorry, not Paul. The, 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 yeah, Paul. Hypernocomen, it is the first person plural. It's the word we. So now notice Paul is not saying that he is more than conqueror. You know, I'm, 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 I'm sure all of us would agree when we examine Paul's life that Paul was a, a more than conqueror. But Paul wasn't speaking of his own experience. But Paul was saying he was including you and I. He's saying, Ron, you are more than conquerors. In fact, Paul was describing every child of God. Even the young man that just received the Holy Ghost last night. Paul was including him and was saying to him that he was more than conqueror. Because this was not because of his experience. This was not because of, you know, his own skill. It wasn't because of his own skill. It wasn't because of his experience. But it was because of what God did for us at Calvary. And so being a more than conquerors, I know the word speaks of a, a, a fight as it were. But even before the fight is finished, Paul is declaring that you are victorious. Even, even for some folks, you know, you have the enemy on the run. And you can easily say that you are more than conqueror because you have got the enemy on the run. But I want to speak to those that are struggling. I want to speak to those that apparently, are, so it may seem, that the enemy have you on the run. I want you to understand that even in your struggles, even in your weakness, Jesus declares that you are more than conqueror. It is a, it is a state of mind that we find ourselves, that we receive from God. It is what God has given to us through the love of God. So it's not by our own experience. It's not by, you know, our own skill. It's not because we pray long. It's not we pray because we pray fast, um, fast long. No. It is because of what Christ did at Calvary. That is what made us 
more than conqueror. Amen. Bless the Lord. And so he lists some things. In verse 39, he said, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. And so here Paul is saying he is persuaded. He is convinced. He is convicted based on his knowledge of God, based on his knowledge of who God is based on his experience in the love of God. He is, the Bible says, you know, he's persuaded, he's fully convinced that, you know, neither death, well, we know death does not separate us from God because um, absence from the body is present with the Lord. Nor life, well, you know, Apostle Paul said, for me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. We know that principalities are powers, you know, these are speaking about rank of angelic being. We know that these things can't separate us um, from the love of God. Amen. He went further to speak about um, things present. And Paul is saying there is nothing present upon this earth as I live now. There is nothing present that has the power, the authority to pray you out of the love of God. There is nothing, he says. And he is even convinced and he's saying, he's speaking and he's saying that in the future, in the future, there is nothing that is going to come. There is no COVID, no sickness, no illness. There is nothing that if you decide as a child of God that you are going to live for God, there is nothing that can prevent you from living for God. The only thing that can prevent you from living for God is you. You are the only thing. You are the only one that can come between you and God. Amen. And so Paul is totally convinced. Amen. That, you know, we are, that there is nothing upon this earth. No demons. No person. No principalities that can pull you out. Of the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Amen. As I get ready to close. So what we have done, we look at in um, Romans chapter 7. We started, as you can see on the slide, in Romans chapter 7, we, 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 we looked at the struggle we, that we have with the nature of sin. Amen. The struggle we have with the nature of sin. Yes, we struggle with the, with the nature of sin. But we are reminded by God that we are called and that we are justified as God's elect. Amen. We are being made we are being made, even as we speak right now, we are being made in the image and the likeness of the Son of God. Amen. God is indeed for us. He is for us. He is vested in our lives. He is fully vested in us making it in the rapture. 
and he is actively doing everything. The omnipotent God is doing everything that is in his power to ensure that we can make it in the kingdom of God. It is not our experience. It's not our skill. It's not our faithfulness that makes us more than conqueror. It is the love of God that caused us to triumph. It is what he did at Calvary that makes us great. It is through Christ that we are more than conquerors. Amen. Uh, bless the Lord. And so um, this is the, as I said before, this is the last session in our missions convention, missions convention 2020, the COVID edition we call it. And um, you know, it is really, it was really um, successful, I believe. You know, the, 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 the various ministers did justice to the theme. And we, we had such great discussion online uh, when we looked at, you know, winning souls in COVID, under COVID conditions. And um, looking back at the missions convention pass, where we look back at a decade of missions conventions from 2010 to 2019. And so, you know, this, and this is our last session. We just want to close in prayer and just thank God for what he did. Um, as I said, surely I believe the saints were revived. This, you know, this person's souls were blessed. And I, I personally believe Missions Convention 2020 was a success. So let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your goodness and your mercies. Lord, we thank you for visiting us. Dear God, we thank you for the great words that you have laid on the heart of your servants and has blessed us with through this week of service. Dear God, we pray that we will not be forgetful hearers, oh God, but that we will apply them to our lives. Dear God, we pray that souls will be drawn and get saved, oh Lord God, because of these words that were spoken. Dear God, we pray that the souls that were revived, that we will keep it, oh God, and it will not just be business as usual, at the end, oh God, but that we will apply to our heart and that our lives will be changed by it. Let your will be done, oh God. We pray for every person that is watching this session today. Dear God, we pray that you will bless them tremendously. We ask you, dear God, to speak to the situation in their lives. Oh Lord God, we want to speak to the things that they are struggling with. Let them know, oh God, that through you, you they are more than conquerors. Oh God, by your love, by your power, by your authority. Have your own way, oh God, as we give you all the praise, all the honor and the glory belongeth unto you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you all. Have a good night.